Welcome back to Volley Today. I'm so excited. In our collection of filmmakers today, we have someone who actually is responsible for putting Indonesia into the minds of many people for the very first time, including me. So I'm really honored to introduce you to my guest, Dr. Lawrence Blair. Hi. Hi, Lawrence. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for Pleasure. coming. Now, I, I sort of, there's a misnomer here. I introduced you, and you're here with all of our filmmakers, which is true, but um, you're actually an anthropologist. So that's how it all began, yeah? That's how it all began. I have a doctorate in something called psychoanthropology, oh. which is a branch of anthropology that deals with the range of the human mind. You know, you've got physical anthropology, which is bodies. You've got social anthropology, which is people in societies. You've got paleoanthropology, which is digging up ancient bones. My field is psychoanthropology, which is why I came here in the 70s to begin making films of tribal peoples in remote communities to try and capture a way of life that would forever vanish, as it has almost done in the last 35, 40 years. That's true. That's the idea true. was to get to these tribal peoples before their own government or missionary groups had got to them, so you could capture a record of a timeless way of living which now we're recognizing is, is quite good, you know? They maintained their forests, they maintained their animals, they lived spiritual lives, they lived without corrupting their environment, but we have wiped them out in the last 50 years. They're disappearing all over the world. I know, it is, um, it's a struggle. Here in Bali, we get to see the effects of um, Consumerism. <laughs> I, I, and as an American, I feel like it's consumerism, almost like a, um, what I find in America, it almost replaces religion. In America, they have so much materialism that they seek spirituality, and here there has been so much spirituality that they go to the other extreme of materialism. It's just a matter of balance all over the world. Historically, we see it all the time. That's true, that's true. And I, I, I'm seeing the synthesis, which is really great. And that's what we're working yes. for. As long as we can all start talking to each other, we'll get it. We'll get the message. Now, as I said, I had never really heard of Indonesia growing up in America until you made and released this amazing film called Ring of Fire. Well, it is a series, uh, and it was based on 10, really 11 years of adventuring with my brother, my late brother who died here in Bali 15 years ago. Yes, we spent 12 years visiting the most remote places in Indonesia, just the two of us most of the time. So we were often in the field for as long as, well, as the longest was nine months at a time, sailing with the Bugis, tribal peoples, uh, living amongst the cannibal Azmat of New Guinea, who were responsible for killing and eating Michael Rockefeller, as you can find out in the Ring of Fire series. We've got the whole story Where there. Where do we get it? I'm, uh, this is just purely selfish, but I want to get it, and I want to watch it now. <coughs> well, the, the, the series can be found on indonesianodyssey.co.uk. Someone, and, please uh, write that down. <laughs> uh, the book <laughs> is available in all the bookshops as of quite recently. It's just been republished again. And it has a new lease of life, because it was, I was told by uh, somebody called Yupa Ave, who really sort of booted off the tourist industry in the 80s, that the Garuda people had said that after Ring of Fire came out on international television, the visitors on Garuda to Indonesia were increased by 50%. I believe that. So it was just at a time in history where this long adventure of 12 years crashed into a four-part series attracted the attention of the whole world to a place that nobody really knew about at all, as you say. That's true. I rather regret that I did it now, of Why? course. Why? Why? Well, you I wanted mean, to stay here by yourself. Obviously, a lot of the wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, quiet, idyllic places are now full of five-star hotels. That's why. That's true. That's true. But I know you have not just rested on your laurels. There's the next series that you're working on now? Well, I've done quite a lot of films since then. Oh, I've I'm done so sorry, IMAX yeah. and Omnimax films. I've also done um, Baraka that you might have heard of. I was involved with Baraka. And then recently I've done a five-part series called Myths, Magic and Monsters, also about Indonesia, for Sky TV, in which we explore all sorts of extraordinary things. For instance, like Homo, like the Homo floresiensis. Sorry, is that a plant? The Homo thingy? Is that a plant? No, it's not a plant. It's a, <laughs> Sorry. An extinct form of human being. Oh. 
You see, all, right. all human beings on the earth are of one species. And the last species of human, there have been about 10 or 12 different species of human beings oh, before Oh, I read us. a little bit of that in Lycae, Richard Lycae, yeah. And we thought that the last one to die out was Neanderthal man about 35,000 years ago in Europe. In Europe, But yeah. then only in 2001, they have discovered the bones of about five different creatures in a cave in Flores, which is referred to as Homo floresiensis, or the hobbit. And they were one meter tall, the adults. And uh, so they had babies that were this big, <laughs> and they were proper human beings. They hunted pygmy elephants. Well, pygmy to us, they would have been full-size elephants to them. Oh, how fascinating. And they would have faced enormous prehistoric pythons, 50 to 60 feet long. And they would have had Komodo dragons then, the ancestor of today's Komodo dragon, which was up to 25 feet long. So you can imagine if you were one meter high and you came across a dragon seven meters long, it would have been a proper dragon. This is fascinating because, of course, the way you're describing them, this could be the root of what we consider the myths of dragons and all that. Absolutely, those. absolutely. And this is what part of this work that I do is about. A lot of creatures that in Europe are mythological animals that were recognized there before we even knew the world was round, long before they'd even discovered Indonesia. So how come they are based, it seems, on certain extraordinary creatures from this part of the world? The myths reached the Europeans through the overland spice trading route. And when you come back and you see things like Komodo dragons, and you see things like little tiny forest folk, mm -hmm. like the miniature man of Flores, or indeed like this other wonderful thing, the world's smallest primate comes from Indonesia, and it's called a tarsia. And it was thought only three years ago that there were as perhaps two species of tarsia. But now they understand there are 12, and at least 12 and still counting. They each speak their own languages. They each special by languages. They twitter at high oh, yeah. frequency. We can't even hear them with the human ear. It has to be transferred down from the ratio at which you record it to, to the range of human hearing. And they all specialize in different parts. So they are a sort of a microcosm of the way human beings separated out from each other, began learning different languages and began specializing in different things. Oh, this is fascinating. So this right. is in your new piece, in your series. Yes, this would be in Myths, Magic and Monsters, including a few other extraordinary things. I mean, we also have a whole series about snakes, serpents. This is a, a land of the Naga and yep. of the snake in mythology and in fact, of man-eating snakes and of the most poisonous snakes, for instance, the sea snakes. And there is an island in the Banda Sea, which is a breeding ground of sea snakes, which, of course, is the most venomous snake on the planet. There's enough venom in the bite of one sea snake to kill 70 people. Oh, I'd heard But that. they're sweethearts. You can dive amongst them. They're curious. They'll knock their little faces against your face plate. They'll play with the bubbles in your... But you've got to go to this volcanic island in the heart of the Banda Sea to experience this. Well, this is very difficult to leave this discussion. Dr. Blair, thank you, <laughs> first of all. Thank you very much. We're going to see some of myths, magic, and monsters, so you'll get to see these exciting... I first came to Indonesia more than 30 years ago. The environment astounded me. The people fascinated me. And I embarked on a three-decade journey of discovery throughout the islands. I encountered extraordinary plants and animals, as well as legends of barely believable beasts. It dawned on me that many of the mythological creatures which have haunted our fairy tales may well have derived from here. So we're going on a quest for the real animals which may have inspired the legends of fire-breathing dragons, of fire-dwelling phoenixes, unicorns, Goblins and hobbits, our smallest and most mysterious relatives.
Once you're away from the big cities, Indonesia is still a place of profound peace. Life remains barely touched by globalization. Here in Indonesia, it's the powers of the invisible, unseen worlds which still illuminate human activity. And with this light comes the shadow side, the darker dimension of both natural and supernatural powers. Over the years, I've seen a lot of strange things here, and heard even stranger stories, and experienced many phenomena which rattle our preconceptions of how life ought to behave. But the most startling revelations concern who we ourselves may be, and have been. The most recent is of a three-foot-tall human being, who flourished as recently as 12,000 years ago, who lived amongst erupting volcanoes, who hunted pygmy elephants and giant rats, and was himself hunted by the ancestor of the Komodo dragon. He throws new light on us. The light also illuminates other dark crevices of legend. Throughout these islands, there have long been tales of a small forest people, a sort of mini yeti of the Southeast Asian jungles, who are occasionally fleetingly glimpsed in the deep forest. Just a myth, you might think. But that myth has now become a reality with the discovery of the remains of real hobbits, or to give them their more formal name, Homo floresiensis. And if these little elves really existed, what truth might lie behind the myths of other legendary creatures? I know these islands pretty well, and I think I know where to look for the evidence I need. So now for the caves of the Hobbit bones, on the worst road yet. We had to repair it ourselves as we went along. And when that didn't work anymore, it was the old fashioned way. So the Hobbits lived right here for at least 30,000 years while Homo sapiens was filtering down through these islands to Australia. And here be caves for hiding. So this is the Liang Bois Cave, meaning cold cave. And despite its large entrance here, it is very secluded. And you wouldn't know that it was a cave until you were right on it. And here it is at the edge of this elevated, secluded little valley. Given the enormous international attention to this cave, you can see that we have a major defensive security barrier. It's an awesome, cathedral-like space. Not hard to feel those lives, stranger than legend, lived by those little people right here, with earthquake and eruptions, preyed on by great lizards and pythons, and, probably, by that larger, rougher man, Sapiens. Limestone caves such as these preserve ancient bones very well indeed. And it is right here, 18 feet beneath me, that most of a skull, a jawbone, and fragments of at least seven other individual hobbits were discovered. They're slightly beneath an ash layer, indicating an eruption of the local volcano 12,000 years ago, above which ash layer we find no more indications of pygmy elephants or of hobbits. The discovery of this tiny skull in 2003 ignited a bombshell of controversy from which the dust has far from settled. It makes a major dent in our assumptions of who we can be. Brain size is one of the yardsticks by which we have separated humans from pre-humans. This contained a brain less than a third the size of ours, smaller than a chimpanzee's. Yet his teeth are completely human. His tools have been meticulously flaked and sharpened. His cooking hearths are charred with controlled fire. And he hunted pygmy elephants, as we can see from these butchered jaws. Pygmy elephants to us 
elephants to him, which definitely required collaborative social behavior, language. So if, despite his tiny brain size, he was human, then what sort? Most anthropologists are arguing that he was a different, parallel species of man, Homo floresiensis, a first cousin. Others, equally respectable, insist he was us, Homo sapiens, marvelously miniaturized. Was, or maybe still is. There are hidden remote communities throughout Southeast Asia which have a haunting genetic distinction. The people are small. Surprisingly close to this cave, there is a village where this gene manifests itself in the men, who are only about four foot tall. This is one of those villages, which our rat wrangling Uncle Rolfino has told me about. Well, it's been quite a struggle to get to this remote little village in this hidden valley where we understand there are extremely small people. The smallest family of this little circular community are still hiding away in that hut over to my left there. So we can see that the people are of quite diminutive stature, but we hope to be able to persuade the particularly small ones to come out and say hello. I'm just wondering if this is going to require as much patience as goblins and phoenixes. When out comes this fellow. Saya duduk di tempat. Okay, mari silakan. I think he's on his way home and doesn't really much want to meet me, but he politely asks me back anyway. Sembilan puluh dua. Sembilan puluh dua. He only speaks this obscure dialect, so we need two translators. He's also as deaf as a post, but talkative. He says there are villages further up where nearly everyone is normal sized, like him. <laughs> Enough, he says. Let's find my sons. Well, he's a very charming old gentleman and he's full of all sorts of fascinating stories and I think you could say that he qualified as really rather short of stature. This is the father, this is the son, there are various other children in the family who are scattered about Indonesia who in fact are the same size as they are. There are numerous other little people, mainly men in this village, the women are of regular size, but this interesting gene is passed down through the men only and we're not very far from the caves of the hobbit himself. Might they have hobbit blood in their veins? Is he floresiensis, stretched, or just sapiens, shrunk? The genetic science has yet to be done. So I'm going home now to Bali. It's been an adventure, all right where the truths have been just as much fun as the myths of dragons and phoenixes and goblins and unicorns and of those small forest folk in legend and ourselves and in the hills of Flores still. For me, Indonesia is a constant reminder that the stairway of science is built with the steps of earlier myths, that the facts about ourselves today will themselves become myths. This human need of ours to categorize and fix into species and time frames seems to obscure the fact that we are transition itself, in constant flux, mutating through countless previous incarnations as fish, reptiles, mammals and early hominids to become briefly what we think we are now. 
As the self-congratulatory survivors of at least 20 species of pre-humans and some 10 species of humans, we might more properly refer to ourselves as Homo homicidens rather than Homo sapiens. And what of Homo floresiensis, that little elf in us all? What became of him? Where he didn't succumb to volcanic eruption, and where we didn't or couldn't interbreed, we probably ate him. Yeah.